Good morning. Today is Monday, September the 13th, and uh, today is Zach Berry's birthday, Pastor Zach's birthday. So we want to wish him a happy birthday. There's several things to make you aware of for your your prayers today. Uh, Debbie Davis, Pastor Butch's wife, is having a knee replacement today, so we want to be praying for her. Remember to pray for Vanessa as she's started a first round of chemo treatment, one down and 15 to go. And today, Constantine begins uh, the transfusion, the bone marrow transfusion. So be praying for he and Leah and the whole family as they're there at the hospital in Augusta for that to take place. And if you would, pray for my wife. She now has been diagnosed positive with COVID and also, my granddaughter, Sayla, and the twins have COVID now. Sarah, thankfully, is is recovering, feels better, felt a lot better yesterday and today. Um, so many that, that we want to lift up in prayer. Um, and it's just <laughs> so much going on. There's so many people uh, facing situations. So remember those prayers. If you have a prayer request, please go ahead and post that so we can be praying for one another. It was a good day yesterday. I was uh, just really encouraged through the service and, and just a time to meet with the body and be with the body and be present with them. Uh, so this morning we're going to pick up in John chapter 5 where where we have uh, been trotting along in our daily in the Word. And there's a hymn that came to my mind this morning. I haven't, I haven't done it in a long time, I don't think. Um, but it's the other grace song. Uh, we have Amazing Grace. Of course, we all know that one. I love that one. But this is grace that is greater than our sin. Grace it is. Let me start that over again. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. remind myself that, that his grace is greater than all my sin. His grace is greater than your sin, not only sins past, but sins current and sins future. And that's not an excuse that we can go out <clears throat> and just live like hellions. But when we fall short, which we do every day, man, his grace is able to cover. I was thinking some have sin in the past that they imagine that God's grace can never cover. But let me tell you, uh, if it's not able to, then we're all in trouble. Uh, so his grace is greater. Picking up in John chapter 5, we have uh, had just seen previous to this the, the man that was healed at the pool of Salaam. And, and it was on the Sabbath day that Jesus had healed him. And he was taking up his mat and walking. And the Pharisees were more concerned that um, that this man and Jesus had broken the Sabbath and commanded one to break the Sabbath uh, than they were of his power demonstrated. 
And we pointed out the fact that the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was not created for God. So it was a day that it was given to us to have rest. And the Jews and their zeal not to break the law of the Sabbath, they had written some 687 additional laws that they had placed on top of the command to, to take rest and have the Sabbath and to cease from all work. And just ridiculous things um, of trying to attain a righteousness before God when that was never God's intent. And the point that we made was that they had supplanted God's law with man's law. And we recognize that we have a tendency to do that as well, that we heap on top of God's law, man-made laws or man-made traditions, and we place that load or that burden on others to follow as well. I'm reminded that Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But the point was they have placed man's traditions, man's requirements above God and his law. And John points out the fact that for this reason in verse 18 and 19, uh, in verse 18, for this reason that Jesus had broken the Sabbath, they sought all the more to kill Jesus. And so they, they were so zealous um, in, in, their, in their own self-righteousness that they sought to kill Jesus because uh, Jesus had broken their law. Uh, we see this recorded in all of the Gospels where this was the reason that the Pharisees were really up in arms at Jesus. And so continue along in verse 19, Jesus makes a statement, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only that which he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And this is not the only time Jesus is going to make this statement. Uh, Jesus came submitting to the Father. Jesus was God himself, yet he submitted to the Father's will and came. And as he was clothed in human flesh, Jesus was still subject to what the Father, or still obedient to what the Father wanted him to do. You remember if we fast forward at the night before Jesus was crucified, where Jesus was in agony over the fact that he would suffer, the death that he would suffer, but more than that, he would have our sins placed on him on the cross. And he, he prayed to the Father, Father, if there's any other way, then let this cup, let this, this uh, cup of wrath pass from me. And Jesus settled and said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And here we see a perfect picture of how Jesus, though being God, as Paul says in Philippians, didn't consider equality with God something to be held on to, but he laid aside certain rights and privileges of deity so that he could come to earth, suffer at the hands of sinful man, so that you and I might have our sins paid for by the shedding of his blood. And so then we pick up in verse um, in verse uh, 20. He says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Uh, here, I, I believe Jesus is speaking of his own resurrection, uh, where they're going to marvel at that. And then in verse, 20, uh, verse 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also son, the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has all given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Now here, verse 21, uh, Jesus is speaking of giving life to those even that would hear him on that day. We have to remember that that every human being is born in Adam's sin. We, we have in our DNA, if you will, a sin nature separated from God because of our sin. And the natural person, the person who has, has not trusted Christ, who has not been born again, as he told Nicodemus in chapter 3, that person is spiritually dead before the Father. You see, when Adam sinned in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, uh, they, they entered into death, not only physical death that they would suffer, but spiritual death, separated from God. 
And it's only through Christ that we can be born again and have life, have spiritual life. And so Jesus is saying, listen, even now I give life to those who would put their trust and their belief in me. Then he says in verse 24, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. It's what we spoke of yesterday, that, that God has called us, you and I as Christ followers to every day, to be sowing a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart, to be cultivating a seed that's already been planted there. And if God would allow us the privilege by his grace to see him work and save somebody, and we're a part of the harvest, that's what we want to be about. Because here Jesus emphatically says, makes no question about it. The one who believes in him has eternal life. Now notice that word has. It's in the present tense. It's in it, it's it's a now thing. And so the moment that somebody trusts Christ, trusts what he did for them, what they could not accomplish on their own, that very moment he says that we have eternal life. We will have physical death. It's appointed man to be born and then to die. And after that comes the judgment. And so, but even though we die physically, when we've trusted Christ, we have eternal life with him. And then he continues on in verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here that the dead speaking of the spiritually dead, not the physical dead, but the spiritual dead. It's now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear his voice will live. Today, you might be watching and, and you've never trusted Christ. You've never trusted what he did for you. You may be a churchgoer. As a matter of fact, you may have gone to church your whole life. You may have cut your teeth in the nursery. But unless one places their trust and faith in Christ and what he has done for them, they have not been born again. We can try to do all the right things. We can live a righteous life. Listen, I know a lot of unsaved people who live a more moral life than many believers that I know. But the Bible says that our righteousness, those right things that we would try to do, our righteousness that we would try to attain on our own is like filthy rags in the sight of God. When Isaiah says that, that our righteousness is like filthy rags, that, that word filthy rags has a reference to a feminine product, and you get the picture. So anything that we might try to do righteous is like filthy rags in the sight of God. Verse 26, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Now here, I believe that <clears throat> that Jesus is, is, is going to make reference to his, his, not his second coming, uh, when there'll be the resurrection of the dead. Uh, when Jesus returns, uh, we know that there'll be a resurrection of the dead. But after his millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign, all those who have died after that in the period of the millennium and all who have died in all of history, will hear his voice, and they will be raised. Now, the righteous will be raised unto eternal life, but those who are unrighteous, those who have not trusted Christ, will be raised, and they will be judged by the Son. And there's not a person that can stand before him in that instance and plead any kind of righteousness on their own. And they'll hear the voice of Jesus saying, Depart from me, for I never knew you. And then comes what the Bible speaks of in Revelation, the second death. There'll be a second death where they'll be cast out into eternal damnation and hell, where Jesus said there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 29, and they'll come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of life. Of judgment. A person may say, well, you know, I'm not an evil person. Listen, we're all evil. 
We are born evil. We're born sinful. The only thing that makes us right, that makes us righteous, is the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. That's the only thing we can plead before him. When we stand before him and he asks us, why should I let you into my into heaven? Why should I let you into my presence? The only answer that you and I have is because Jesus suffered a, a sinner's death on a sinner's cross, and my sins were placed on him at that time. He shed his blood, and the wrath of a holy God was poured out on him in my place, and I placed my trust in what Christ has done. That's the only reason that you and I have been given the gift of eternal life, if we've placed our trust in him. Listen, ask the Lord to give you an opportunity today that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, wherever you go, that God will make you keenly aware of those people that he's placing in your path. Be quick and be ready to sow a seed of the gospel in their heart, your testimony, your story of how Jesus saved you. If you recognize that you come across somebody today that, that they have um, uh, some affection for God, uh, that, that, that there's been a seed planted, that God will allow you, that God would give you the wisdom to share Christ with them, to cultivate that seed, to turn up that soil in their heart. And if God, by his grace, would allow you to witness somebody to be saved, let's be about the mission that he has called us to, to sow a seed, to cultivate a seed, and to reap a harvest. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. To remember to be praying for those that we mentioned this morning. I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you. And this weekend when you're here, I want to encourage you to take one of those cards on the Connect desk, whether you've sown a seed, whether you have cultivated a seed, or whether you've been able to participate in the harvest. Fill that card out. Grab that T-shirt. That helps support CCCD. And uh, give me some good stories to be able to share. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. Have a great day.